What's up, San Diego? Good morning to you on a Sunday morning. A little bit of a rainy morning, obviously, throughout town. Thunderstorms last night. Some rain again into the morning today. It expected to be raining throughout the afternoon. I will carry you through the first two hours of this morning from 8 to 10 as we talk a lot about Padres baseball. We talk about this Shohei Otani scandal. Go back to yesterday. If you missed any of yesterday, and the Peter Seidler Memorial, we'll talk about that as well and play some of the great speeches from, you know, the people that were very, that were impacted by Peter Seidler's life. So, looking forward to being able to discuss all of that with you. Plus, San Diego State has a basketball game today against Yale, or should I say tonight, for a trip to the Sweet 16. That would be something to see the Aztecs back in Sweet 16 play as they continue to motor on through the NCAA tournament. We'll talk about their last game, too, how they were able to beat UAB, how they were able to avoid disaster against the Blazers because there was a little bit of a time right there where I thought San Diego State was going to lose, but they played through and were able to knock down UAB and get. A nice little W in the NCAA tournament. So we'll talk all about that as more as, you know, the Padres and what we saw in Korea. Kind of recap the week and preview this week. we got some Padres baseball coming up tomorrow. Padres will be playing some exhibition games coming up tomorrow and Tuesday. Tomorrow's game is a night game and Tuesday's game is an afternoon game. Neither of them count in the standings. I do have to remind people of that because they went from playing games that count to playing games that don't count. And then playing games that count again on opening day on Thursday. Get you a Major League Baseball preview as well coming up later on. So far, my predictions are 100%. And my MLB predictions. MLB predictions are 100% because I thought the Padres would split in Korea. And so far, that's exactly what they've done. So 100% on the predictions. I use the playoff predictor app online and you can go through the entire season. If you wanted to, I did that for my playoff predictions for major league baseball. And with baseball starting up on Thursday, thought I'd give that to you guys, but I think the Padres are going to win 84 games this year. So far off to a good start, a good split in Korea. And we'll talk to that, talk about that in just a little bit. I want to talk about this Shohei Otani thing. And I'm going to spend some time in the next segment talking about it as well. But kind of set the stage for exactly what's going on here in this scandal, if you will. Now, this entire thing came about because of a bookie in Southern California who was being investigated by the federal government for an illegal gambling ring, if you will, here in Southern California. And in the process of this gentleman, Boyer, being investigated by the feds, what came up during this investigation was a wire transfer, or should I say multiple wire transfers that equaled a grand total of $4.5 million from arguably the biggest name in baseball internationally, Shohei Otani's bank account to this bookie, which didn't happen like recently. This happened over a year ago, and it was multiple transactions between a bank account with Shohei Otani's name on it And Boyer, wire transfers. So what happened in Korea was as the media was starting to investigate, it sounded like there has been a longtime article on this that, that, that reporters had been working on. Was they basically, the media 
came up to Otani and his camp and said, we're going to go with this story. Do you have any thoughts on it? That's usually how it works. It's not just like thrown together at the last minute. I mean, this has taken long, a long time to come about. And in that process, Shohei Otani's camp sent the translator to talk to the media and do this full down, sit down interview with ESPN. And in doing so, Pepe Mizuhara admitted that he had a gambling problem, a very large gambling problem, in which Shohei Otani, since they are such close friends and have been inseparable for long periods of time, covered the gambling debts that Mizuhara accumulated to help out his friend. And that's why he wire transferred the money to Boyer, the illegal gambling guy, the bookie. ESPN went with the story. Everything was fine. And then the next morning, all of a sudden, Otani's camp drastically changed course because again, Despite Otani not making the bets in this story, transferring money to an illegal gambling ring via a wire transfer and paying off debts, regardless if you've made the bets or not, not only violates Rule 21 of Major League Baseball's handbook for their players, but also is still a federal offense because it's still a legal activity. Since Shohei Otani is not an American citizen, and this is a felony, not saying it would have happened, but what was on the table was Shohei Otani being deported from the United States and then ultimately being banned from ever coming back from the United States. That's one of those situations that, you know, could be facing this. Now, regardless if that was actually going to happen or not, is a different story. But obviously, that was something that the Otani camp didn't want to play with. So they come back and they say, Mizuhara, the translator for Shohei Otani, actually stole the money and wire transferred it himself to pay off the debts. And it was actually a theft by Mizuhara, of Shohei Otani's money. And Otani knew nothing about this. And he is, they're, they're playing that he's naive, and they're saying that, you know, his English isn't very good, and, you know, a lot of the stuff was lost in translation. Because, again, the original story was not good. Now, I could have bought the original story, and I could have even have bought the second story if they weren't right back-to-back of each other, and they quickly change the story. Which leads to a couple of possibilities here with this story. Nate Silver does an incredible job of kind of laying this all out at natesilver.net. He actually posts it for free if you want to read his full article. Why did Shohei Otani allegedly wire money to a bookie? There's a couple of possibilities that come out that Nate Silver lays out in his article that he pulls from Craig Calcaterra that we talked about on the Andy Nelson show earlier this week about a good roundup of allegations and the various possibilities of what actually happened because you're not going to know what actually happens yet and by the way there has been some news since then over the weekend Friday news dump Major League Baseball decided to actually start investigating the story which is hilarious And then yesterday, you find out that Mizuhara, who claimed he got a degree from UC Riverside, apparently never attended UC Riverside at all. The Highlanders at UC Riverside have no records of Mizuhara attending 
their school. That's a separate issue. But here are the three possibilities of what, what potentially happened. There might be some other ones that are leaked in there as well. But the three main possibilities are, number one, Mizuhara is a compulsive gambler who got in way, way over his head with a bookie to pay the bookie off. He offered either one or several massive wire transfers from Otani's account without authorization. He got busted, he got fired, and he's about to be in a world of federal legal trouble and will almost certainly be permanently banned from holding a job in Major League Baseball. That's possibility number one. And possibility number one is what Otani's camp wants you to think. Fair enough. We'll take that as a consideration. Possibility number two. These are these were Mizuhara's gambling debts. And as per his and the spokesperson's comments to ESPN, Otani felt bad for Mizuhara. Remember, these guys are longtime friends. Their wives hang out together. Their families spend time together. They're inseparable. And now, and all the time, by the way, they're in the dugout together, always goofing around, having a good time. There's video evidence of them doing that on Wednesday during the Padres-Dodgers game before this thing got really out of hand and before the Dodgers decided to fire Mizuhara. Very interesting. So, possibility number two, Mizuhara was in deep crap with his gambling debts. As per the spokesperson's comments to ESPN, Otani felt bad for him. Wanted to help him out. Covered his debts by transferring the money to the bookie, which, by the way, is still illegal. Carries a federal offense, which could lead to deportation, although I don't really buy that actually happening. But a problem, nonetheless, that Otani's camp did not want to deal with. Possibility number three. These were Otani's gambling debts, and Mizuhara is taking the bullet for his patron. I can believe that one a little bit more than the others, but we're going we're gonna to try to pretend like those aren't, aren't the case, although... The more this gets out, the more interesting the story seems to be. Now, those are kind of the three main options on the menu. There are probably some in-between possibilities as well. For this situation, such as that Mizahara was doing things that Otani was faintly aware of and grudgingly going along with, you know, say they made some bets that he couldn't lose loading money to a friend, that sort of thing. Otani earned a total of $65 million in salary and endorsements in 2023, had a nine-figure payday looming. It's not against baseball's rules to bet on sports other than baseball. Itself an important clue about the high tolerance for gambling among athletes. Although sports betting isn't, isn't legal in California, perhaps Otani, concerned with getting ready for his next start against the Texas Rangers or shooting another commercial, couldn't really be bothered with the details. Paradoxically, there is often a high degree of trust in high-stakes gambling circles. Now, that is all laid out in the article by Nate Silver, who kind of lays out everything that's going on and using kind of the gambling realm that he is a part of. Again, he comes up with a lot of probability and analytical key points for either elections that we've seen, but also used to work for ESPN with the 538 Sports. So obviously with probability and making ranking systems and picking predictions, that's he's very much inclined with the gambling circle. I have a hard time believing a lot of these stories. For a many for many a reasons. One, just to be able to take the word from Mizahara and Otani at face value, I think is kind of a joke. So you can't really believe what they have to say. They had one opportunity to tell the truth, and all of a sudden, the story was conflicting immediately. Therefore, I don't really care what they have to say anymore. I don't believe it, regardless of what they say. They could come forward with the truth right now, regardless of what it is, and I don't believe them anymore. They ruined that opportunity. I'm not really buying what ESPN has to say either because they've kind of put this under the rug, and they also have a lot to lose in this situation as a major partner of Major League Baseball. Think about all the outlets that are telling you what's going on. They all have something to lose. 
Major League Baseball has something to lose. This guy is their most marketable player in the world. Most international, talked about player, the Babe Ruth of baseball right now. They can't afford to lose this guy. The Dodgers can't afford to lose this guy. ESPN, all the TV, media, outlets can't afford to lose this guy. And those are the three entities that are telling you what's going on, basically showing that Otani has nothing to do with this, never gambled, never gambled on baseball, and everything was Mizahara. In fact, to the point where Mizahara stole from Otani. Without Otani's knowledge, there are so many holes to poke in this story. So many holes. And we're going to poke those holes in the story in just a little bit. I do want to talk about more, some other things that happened in baseball. Obviously, we had Peter Seidler's memorial yesterday. We're going to play some of the clips, some of what we can't play, as I knew before. AJ Preller said a bad word, so we can't play that clip yet. We'll play it later in the week when we bleep out those words that he used in his speech about Peter Seidler. But there was a lot of good ones that we want to air that we'll get to later on in the show. Do want to talk about San Diego State basketball, who is in action again tonight. They'll be taking on Yale for a trip to the Sweet 16 and potentially a rematch with UConn, a rematch of the national championship. But they got to get through Yale first in order to do that. I'll give you my Major League Baseball playoff, or sorry, my season predictions. And we'll talk a little bit more about how the Padres did in Korea and what lines up against the series against the San Francisco Giants. But when we come back, there are major problems with this Otani story. And all of them start relating back to maybe this is an Otani problem with gambling and not a Mizuhara problem with gambling. I'll explain next on the Brayton's Apprentice Show, live and local on a Sunday, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
824 on a Sunday morning here at America's Finest City. A little rainy out there today. But we are live and local. We were supposed to be down at FanFest today, but it was rained out. Unfortunate. But anybody that had a ticket to FanFest could request a ticket up to four free ones for the exhibition games, either tomorrow or on Tuesday. They are doing the garage sale down there as well. During those games, so if that was one of the big drivers for you going down to Fan Fest, that is still going to be on, and you can go out and check that out tomorrow night and on Tuesday. What do you like? Love the chat, guys, in the YouTube. It's hard to try to run the show and respond to everybody in the chat, but I appreciate you guys chiming in. Johnny, Jorge, thanks again. Lisa, Jesse, can you guys post in the YouTube chat? What's up to all of you joining us on there? If you want to join the phone, the conversation, 833-288-0973, 833-288-0973. I don't know what the fans have to think about this. And I think there is a difference on this Otani scandal, okay? I, I think you have to take off that Padres hat for a second and view this away from the fact that you don't want Shohei Otani on the Los Angeles Dodgers. I think that comes away as a little bitch. I, if it's any other team, probably let's point it out, but let's, let's not overreact just because the guys on the Dodgers and it would be a lot better for my sports team. If he disappeared off the arch rival, that's kind of a bad, I think it's a bad taste. I think it's a bad look and Padres fans. We need to be better than that. So don't do it for those things. Let's talk about it from a sense of why this story stinks and why it doesn't make any sense. So we laid out the three possibilities. Number one, Ms. Ahar has got a gambling problem and he stole money to pay off his gambling debts from Otani by wiring transferring money from Otani's account to the bookie. Option number two, Otani actually knew about Ms. Ahara's gambling problem and he decided to help him out and pay off the debts of Ms. Ahara. I had $4.5 million in debt to this bookie and he paid it off by wire transferring the money to the bookie Boyer. Or option number three, these are actually Otani's debts, and Mizahara's taking the fall for Shohei Otani. Now, taking the fall for him and losing your job is one thing. Taking the fall for him and now potentially being arrested on federal charges and now giving up some of your freedoms by serving time in prison, that is a whole different story. So that's very interesting as well. And again, as I mentioned before, be careful of who you're listening to on who's telling you this story based on what people have to lose. And there's a lot of people that can lose a lot of different things. Major League Baseball has major contracts with betting companies now, with FanDuel, with DraftKings. You can name all of them, prize picks, whatever. Fantasy baseball, all of this. They have a lot to lose in this situation. And they can't denounce gambling. So it's an interesting double-edged sword where you don't want any of your players to partake in this gambling because it upsets the quality of the game, the integrity of the game, but at the same time, you're willing to take the cash from these betting companies because they make you a ton of money. ESPN, another one of those entities that benefits from DraftKings and FanDuel and Fantasy and all that sort of stuff, but also that benefits from Shohei Otani being on television and them being a major contributor in terms of a rights holder for Major League Baseball. And be careful what they have to say. And then, of course, Otani's camp and Mizahara themselves. I don't know why you would believe anything they say at this point. Let's talk about some of the problems in this article. Not really the article, but some problems in the story. First of all, $4.5 million is a lot of money. That is a lot of money to be in debt relative to Mizahara's salary, which, according to what they had to say, was about $300,000 to $500,000 annually. $4.5 million in gambling debt for a guy like Shohei Otani makes a lot of sense. $4.5 million in debt for a guy like Mizuhara's salary doesn't make any sense at all. Bob Volgaris is one of the world's best high-stakes bettors out there. He points out, again, I'm not part of this gambling world, and some of you guys might be. 
it's not easy to get that sort of money down. And any bookie is going to have to do some due diligence on their patron having high confidence that the debts could be settled. And the fact that this guy got to that amount of money is insane. That nobody in that part would have been like, oh, this guy can't afford this. I can't just keep giving him these bets. That's problem number one. Doesn't make any sense. That points more to option three, where this might be Otani's debts. And again, we'll figure out how this comes about. I'm just trying to put two and two together here and letting you guys come up with your own opinions. Again, if you want to jump in on the conversation, 833-288-0973. Kathy's already on hold. We're going to get to her in just a second. Number two, again, I've already really mentioned this. We shouldn't take much that Mizuhara or Otani say at face value. Totally agree with this. They had their opportunity to tell the truth. They said their story. Then they drastically changed their story. And there are so many holes in these two stories and nothing lining up that now I no longer believe anything that Otani says, his camp, or Mizuhara says about this situation. From the excerpt from Craig Calcaterra. Initially, a spokesperson for Otani told ESPN the slugger had transferred the funds to cover Mizuhara's gambling debt. The spokesman presented Mizuhara to ESPN for a 90-minute interview Tuesday night, during which Mizuhara laid out his account in great detail. However, as ESPN prepared to publish the story Wednesday, the spokesman disavowed Mizuhara's account and said Otani's lawyers would issue a statement. This sounds like a scene or an episode out of the TV show, or should I say Netflix show, Suits. It seems like an episode out of Suits. Anybody seen Suits? Okay, it was very popular. Actually, it was really popular during COVID because it was a show that started when I was in high school and rolled through about 2019, about a five-year-old show. And a lot of people are binge-watching it now. But in that show, it's about, you know, kind of lawyers, you know, in America that that have, you know, high high-priced clients and all these other sort of things. The two main characters in that show. One's named Mike, one's named Harvey. This is kind of a situation where Mike and Harvey represent Otani. And this comes about. They get the report. The reporter comes in and goes, hey, look, this is what we're doing. I'm going to run this story. Don't make me run this story on your client. And then they drastically try to figure something out. And Mike comes up with the great idea that, well, we'll just say that Otani's such a nice guy. He was covering the debts of his longtime friend, Ms. O'Hara, in order to get him out of debt. He didn't make the bets. Nobody's going to care. And look, we could paint Otani in this great light of being such a great friend for bailing his buddy out of $4.5 million in debt. What a great idea, Mike. All right, here you go. Go talk to ESPN. And then the next morning, realizing that it's still an illegal gambling ring, and that paying an illegal gambler is, in fact, against the rules and the law. And not only does that hamper Otani for Major League Baseball, regardless if he was making a bet on Major League Baseball or not, it still violates a rule, which is don't be making illegal gambling payments. That's problem number one. You might be facing a suspension or even a fine. Problem number two is it's still a felony in the United States because gambling is illegal in California. And as a citizen, not of the United States, but of Japan, he could potentially be deported from the United States. I don't know, Mike. That's probably not a good thing. Now, is it? So that's when, again, Mike and Harvey, suits episode here realize that they've made a catastrophic mistake and Harvey now has to go in there and fix the problem that Mike incurred because as confident Mike is most times than not, he does make some mistakes with his arrogance. And so Harvey comes in and fixes the problem. He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to say, and we're going to pin everything on the translator to try to save Otani's ass. And that's where the second story comes in of Mizuhara Without Otani's knowledge, since he has access to his accounts, which some assistants do have, and with the high-priced Otani 
and some of the liens I'm sure he has and the allowances he has for having so much money in a bank. Probably wouldn't get this red flag to many banks when a wire transfer. Ms. O'Hara goes in and he transfers the money himself because he has access to it because Otani is so popular and busy and has so much money. He needs people to do this for him. So he entrusts his right-hand man to do these things for him. And he transfers the $4.5 million to the bookie to pay off his own debts. This does a couple of things. Now, all of a sudden, Otani's the victim. He is no longer the person in trouble here. He is the victim. He had nothing, he had no idea about this money vanishing from his account. And he can't believe what Mizuhara did. And now everything's pinned on Mizuhara. And all of a sudden, he's in a whole world of hurt. And Otani's just the victim who lost $4.5 million. Couldn't believe it. He had nothing to do with this. Knew nothing about it. Unbelievable. So that's why, based on that entire sequence, again, I've kind of played it in two suits. His, his lawyers are not named Mike nor Harvey. That's where you can't really believe much of what they say at face value. By the way, ESPN, big partner of Major League Baseball, and now directly involved in the sports betting business. By the way, they have their own show called ESPN Bet. Backtracking and just going with this immediately after with the news story is very, very interesting. And by the way, they didn't air the interview. Why didn't they? Very interesting to see, nonetheless. Take what the parties are telling you at face value. Or do not take them at what at face value. You shouldn't take what Mizuhara, Otani, or ESPN are telling you at face value because they have so much to lose. Number three. Now, this has since changed because it started to transpire on Friday. Friday news dump. Friday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Major League Baseball was like, oh, we're going to start investigating this. It's ridiculous Major League Baseball took this long, but it's also ridiculous that for a long period of time, they have not officially investigated the Otani's involvement. I mean, obviously, a lot of it is semantics with Major League Baseball looking into the matter, gathering information, letting the feds handle this themselves. But the fact that they did not go, we need to open up an investigation is ridiculous, especially when they have a looming issue with Pete Rose in which he is not allowed to be a part of the Hall of Fame. He's banned for life because he was gambling on baseball. And to say that these guys maybe gambled, but they didn't gamble on baseball. Oh, trust us. We didn't gamble on baseball. I don't know about you, but $4.5 million in debt to a gambling site and you have inside access to baseball is like, oh, yeah, now all of a sudden we're going to take the moral high ground and not bet on baseball. I'm not buying that either. The final point here, the story is not really about legal sports betting. It's about illegal sports betting. The world of FanDuel, this is laid out in Nate Silver's article. The world of FanDuel and DraftKings and ESPN bets since bookmaking operation that Otani allegedly wired money is to is illegal. Now, I wouldn't go as, so far as to buy the industry's inevitable spin. See, this proves we just need the need for legal sports betting. There have been problems with that, too, especially in the NFL, with stricter rules for players, with the backlash to the proliferation of legal betting apps is somewhat... Different to the Otani story, it's, as o Nate Silver puts, germane in the sense that it raises the stakes, affects the motivation of various parties, but journalists ought to focus on figuring out what happened here first before drawing too many moral lessons. I agree with that as well. Figure out what's going on with this. Again, the biggest problem that happened here was in the investigation, the federal investigation of an illegal bookie in Southern California turned up that Otani's bank account with his name on it wired up to $4.5 million to a bookmaker. There's a lot of problems I have with this. Again, even if you want to buy the stories that he wasn't actually the one betting, a lot of the stuff that he's done is illegal, and there should be some backlash with this. There should be some consequences, and the fact that Major League Baseball doesn't want to put any consequences on this, and again, they have to wait. But for anybody, and I'm not convicting him already. I want to see more information that comes out. But to just try to push this under the rug because everybody's got a lot of money on the lines is utterly ridiculous. 
I don't want to hear ever again from Major League Baseball any type of moral high ground when it comes to Pete Rose if they're going to let this slide on Shohei Otani, regardless of if he made the bets or not. He is still committing a federal act. Again, Annie Halbert brought this up on the show, and she said, well, where's the scandal if he didn't make the bet? The scandal is Otani's bank account wiring money to an illegal gambler. That is a scandal. That is a problem. That is a bad optic for Major League Baseball. You cannot have your best player in baseball, the Babe Ruth, the almost Jesus of the sport, to be wiring money regardless of what it was for to an illegal gambler. I have multiple questions on that, too. Let's say he was covering the debts of Mizuhara. Why didn't he just wire transfer the money to Mizuhara and just keep his name completely out of the conversation with the better? If he wired $4.5 million to his buddy, he didn't know what it was for. You could pull the argument that he didn't know what was going on. But the fact that the $4.5 million got sent to the bookmaker is ridiculous. That's the bad optic. Again, if you want to lay into that just he's just so naive and so dumb that he lets people handle all of his money, everything's handled for him, and he doesn't know anything that's going on, and that's why he stole the money. If you're Mizahara, why are you that stupid? I mean, what a catastrophic mistake. By both Otani and Mizuhara. If you buy the story, the catastrophic mistake on Otani is, by the way, being this naive when you are this important. Being this important comes with major responsibility. You are now obviously in the public eye. The same thing can be said for any of us on air. To be extra careful where you are at, what you say, how you conduct yourself, because people will have that opinion of you. I have to remind myself of that when I go play softball and get a little too competitive. You're in the public image. I'm not even close to the level of Otani when it comes to public recognition and high stakes for a major league organization. Major League Baseball's number one guy is Shohei Otani. You should probably be a little bit more careful than this. So even if what they're telling you is true, which I say is BS, you cannot be that dumb when it comes to your finances, when it comes to your trust in people, any of that. After the fact, the Dodgers talked about how smart Otani is financially when he came up with the contract idea to offset the costs for his team by taking deferred payments, which, by the way, was dumb financially. It's good for the Dodgers. Doesn't make any sense for Shohei Otani. I can't believe this story. I can't believe people that buy this story. There is so much BS in this story. So much. That as much as I would love to believe the story where Otani is the victim here, you can't do it because none of it makes sense. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe this is how Scraby feels when he does his conspiracy theory things. I don't think it's that big of a conspiracy. It doesn't make any sense on multiple fronts. And every time you try to make something seem like it's true, you continue to poke holes in the story. I want to hear what you fans have to say. 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973. We're going to get to Kathy's phone call if you want to join us. Join the show. Get your opinion on this matter. It doesn't make any sense. I can't be the only one that thinks this is BS. And again, don't view it from the standpoint of being a Padres fan and you'll do whatever it takes to get Otani off the Dodgers. View, view it from a neutral perspective of what exactly is happening in this story. There's going to be a lot more to come out of this. But it doesn't make any sense. Join us next. 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973. Braden Sopranet Show. Live and local every Sunday. San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Brayton's Apprentice Show live and local each and every Sunday on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3. The fan gets you some local programming. The guy before is making me sick with his kind. I mean, his kind of like biased answers on this stuff, trying to protect the brand, protect the thing. I think too many media members do that now where they're not really reporting on the the BS. And that for some reason, they got a clothespin on their nose when the, when the, when the smell of BS lingers around. It would be a better job of holding some of these entities accountable for some of these stories. But the Otani scandal is wild, man. It is wild. There's so many different ways for this. And to be honest, I mean, nobody's... Not, the common folk, us common folk out there, are ain't buying this. Not buying it one bit. I mean, there is a level of how stupid do you think we are when it comes to this story. And I know... People can be dumb. I complain about that sometimes. But how dumb do you think everybody is to just sit there and be like, oh, he's the victim. They stole money from him. Come on. It more leans to, I, I mean, I, I have my, my opinion on some of this stuff, and I don't want to incriminate anybody. I still need some more, some more evidence in this deal, but it doesn't look good for Shohei in terms of this, this story. What do you guys think? 833-288-0973, 833-288-0973. I see your guys in the chat. Sorry, I can't respond via text or comments. I'll try to answer on the air as much as I can just because it's I'm trying to do a bunch of different things at once here, running the one-man band. But if you do want to call into the show, you can. Kathy did. Let's get to Kathy in LA. Kathy, what's going on? Hey, Braden. Being a Padre fan, it's really hard to stay objective about this whole thing just because he's a Dodger. But to me, the fact that the story changed and it changed after saying, well, you know, hey, it's illegal to wire money for you know, gambling debt, especially to an illegal bookie. That's what has me kind of going, mm, I don't buy the story either. And a lot of the stuff that you brought up, you know, the points you brought up are really good that who, who, you know, what is really going on? And that's the biggest thing is we don't know what's going on. I don't know if we'll ever know what really happened because of everything that you brought up about how important he is to the game and how MLB, the Dodgers, ESPN all want Otani to stay in the game. So it makes you go, okay, what's going to actually happen? Because I just get the feeling that's going to be nothing that's going to happen. That's that's my fear too, and Kathy, I, I really appreciate the phone call. Thanks again. We're getting close to the top of the hour. That I think that's the fear of a lot of baseball fans, and I think they they don't want to sit here and listen to to how great Major League Baseball is and the high ground that they take and and everything with this 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 scandal when it comes to their best player. I mean, there are players that could take the fall for this hundred percent that are on the list. I think there's players in the Padres they would wouldn't care if this happened to them. They would get rid of them immediately. But Shohei Otani's too big to fail. He's too big to fail. Shohei Otani's like Harvey Dent. He's supposed to be like the hero of Gotham City. He's supposed to be the hero of Major League Baseball. He's going to save baseball out of the dark, dark ages as they try to compete with the rest of the leagues. Wait long enough, you see yourself become the villain. He got into the muck, getting into the muck with the, the down and dirty on this part, and put himself in a bad spot. The fall of Shohei Otani, if this were to come out and he actually did make bets, I mean, he literally would be Harvey Dent of Major League Baseball. I'm going to weigh in on, on social media. Like Nate Silver said in the article, which we quoted on the show, these guys will try anything to give themselves the edge to get back on top, especially if they're in a hole. I'm sure there's others, and now that Major League Baseball has opened an invest official investigation, the answer to those questions should come out. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think this is a serious problem. I mean, during that last break, I cut the commercials off so you guys on YouTube can't hear them. I think we have to do it for legal purposes. There was a DraftKings ad. I mean, they sponsor at Odyssey. I'm sitting here talking about how bad this is for so, for for Major League Baseball to have one of their entities, one of their patrons, one of their players involved in an illegal gambling sting. Meanwhile, it's presented by DraftKings. It's a slippery slope. 
that professional sports have got themselves into. They want the money of gambling. But they don't want the consequences of it either. We talked about it in the week. I mean, as, as crazy as the pros are, I mean, that, that's one thing. At least those guys are making a ton of money. You start talking about college kids. And with all these parlays, you get down the rabbit hole of some of these betting apps. I mean, in legal gambling states, what is keeping a college player from being over or under a prop bet to help out his roommate make some cash? It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, that we didn't even really talked about that, but, I mean, you could bet on almost anything in the United States right now when it comes to sports. March Madness is going on right now. If there's a prop bet on Jaden Ledee making free throws and some people he knows in college put 10 grand on it as a group, we're going to give him 10% if he misses one free throw. He doesn't have to throw the game. It's insanity, and that's stuff that you can't even you can't even monitor that kind of stuff. We're talking more about that. We're also going to talk about Peter Siler's memorial when we come back on the Braden Sprint Show on setting us up on Sports Station ninety seven through the fan.
Hour number two on the Braden Supranet show. It's spent a lot of time on the Shohei Otani news, and that story ain't going away. And you got to keep pushing on this story because they want it to go away. And I'm not pushing on it because I don't like Otani. I think Otani's a great player, and you know the guy gambles. The guy gambles, but you know I I I don't like seeing you know certain people play by different rules because they're more important than other people in the eyes of some organizations. You know, the fact that he's a Dodger bears no different story on this that I would say if he was a Yankee or any other Major League Baseball player. I think he'd be a little bit more cautious, obviously, if he's a Padre. But that being said, I mean, this is just, it is what it is. I don't want to hear from Major League Baseball all the time, you know, their high and mighty moral compass when the reality is when it comes to people's wallet, they change that. But that was a good first hour. We're going to transition into talking a little bit more about Peter Seidler here. And we got some good clips from 97 Through the Fan and a clip from KUSI about, you know, the Peter Seidler celebration of life that was held yesterday that I think a lot of you were able to attend. If not, um, I know I I was unfortunately unable to go because I had USD baseball obligations, but there's a lot of good stuff. And a lot of great things to say about a man that was a great man. You know, not just owner, but probably a better man outside of owning a Major League Baseball team than he was just being the owner to all of our favorite beloved Padres team, obviously. I think some people in there were in the comments saying it was a good service and everything. There's a couple of things I wanted to play, you know, that get you excited about trying to live on Peter Seidler's legacy. And I know he would want us to live on and and live that legacy that he did, you know, early in the morning when he was helping out the homeless and and doing his part to make other people's lives better, more so than trying to get a championship to San Diego. But there were some interesting comments made, not really interesting, but some, some ones that I think are worth sharing. Uh, We're not going to share the uh, AJ Preller one yet. We're still going to edit that audio for uh, later in the week, but, there, there was one from Eric Katsenda, who I think just naturally is getting a bad rap because he's the one in charge of getting the finances ready for the Padres. You know, I, I think that's part of the plan that they had to enact, obviously just spending money and throwing it down the drain to have a high payroll with some of these luxury tax payments and everything. So, stuff that the Yankees are having to deal with right now I think is not part of the plan. And so by trying to get under the... CBT. You know, Eric Kutsenda gets a bad rap because it's, he seems to be the scapegoat for the guy that doesn't, you know, was the reason why the Padres couldn't bring in any type of players. And that's not even like the truth. That's just what people are assuming. Here's what Eric Kutsenda had to say at the service yesterday, talking about his beloved friend and partner for a long period of time in Peter Seidler. There's more to say than time permits. And anyway, when measured against the eloquence of Peter's life, our words are very inadequate. And so I'll conclude these remarks with his words, spoken just last year. One year soon, the baseball gods will smile on the San Diego Padres, and we will have a parade. To which I reply, on behalf of all of us gathered here today, we rejoice, dear Peter, that you are now one of those baseball gods safely tucked into heaven. And we will do our part to fulfill your prophecy, knowing, in fact, that you are with us every step of the way. Now, those are some pretty chilling remarks from Eric Atsenda, who obviously lost a friend, a longtime business partner, was choked up during that speech. But that's a guy to me that is not going to let this organization fall by the wayside, nor fall in a spot that's not competitive and let his friend down Peter Seidlin. 
I thought you got a genuine answer out of Eric Atsenda. This is a man that we don't really know too much about, right? He takes over as kind of that interim chair of the Padres to kind of carry the way for a year, maybe two years to get the organization intact before obviously trying to pass it to somebody else in the Seidler family. And so not too much was known about Eric Katsenda, at least in the general public. And you got to see him, you know, be emotional and, and be who he is in that speech about Peter Seidler. And to me, that's a guy that is going to do everything in his power to make sure that he could try to bring the promise that Peter Seidler made to the Padres fans about the parade and being on top of Major League Baseball and bring a championship to the San Diego Padres and the San Diego community. That was some pretty good comments made there. There was also some other ones that we have posted on our Twitter page with Tom Seidler and Joe Musgrove and Manny Machado, AJ Preller, as I mentioned. And, you know, guys like Mike Schilt, manager, trying to do everything in his power to make that happen and that dream become a reality. And something they can wanted be- to get to another one here as local product. Joe Musgrove had some thoughts yesterday at Peter Seidler's memorial. Here's what Joe Musgrove had to say. Peter and his team have given the San Diego Padres fans something they can be proud of. He had a vision of what he wanted and put his money where his mouth is and stepped to the plate. He built a team of people around him that could go get the right pieces to give this city a real shot at winning a World Series and gave them what they needed to accomplish that. As players, and I know I can speak on behalf of all my teammates when I say this, we realize the opportunity that we have here in San Diego. For as long as any of us can remember, we've wanted the opportunity to play baseball in the big leagues, to put on a major league uniform and say that you were good enough to play with the big dogs. As you get older and your skills develop and your confidence grows, your ambition grows as well. You go from wanting to just say that you made it to wanting to win championships. And as any former player knows, your time in this game is limited. Fewer than 10% of us will get a chance to play 10 years in the big leagues. And you spend a lifetime of work towards working towards something that if you're lucky, will give you 10 years to achieve. And as good of a player as you may be, those years might very well be spent on a team that never even sniffs a shot at the playoffs. My point is, every player in that locker room realizes how great of an opportunity we have here in San Diego. That during our short careers, we get to be part of a team that has the firepower that we do, the front office and leadership team that we do, and the ability to play baseball in the best city in the country in front of the best fans in the game. We have an opportunity to accomplish a personal lifelong goal and give the city of San Diego its first world title. All of that is possible because Peter had a vision to change the landscape of baseball in San Diego, and he acted on it. 100%, Joe. It's exactly what Peter Seidler did. I mean, you could talk about as much as you want about and and saying and sharing the same story that every Major League Baseball team says. We're trying to win a championship, and we want to bring a championship here. And you hear every manager say that at every new job that they have. You hear every owner say that at every possible place. But what Peter did was he put his money where his mouth was, and he invested in the team. And the Padres invested in the Petco Park, and they invested in the San Diego community. And they had done that ever since they took over. And now a lot of that has to do with, you know, especially with the the contracts and upkeeping Petco Park, but they would have done that anyway. The new Gallagher Square is going to be awesome. The upgrades that ballpark is the reason why they're the number one ballpark in all of Major League Baseball. And Peter Seidler is the owner that the Padres needed, but also the owner that San Diego has been needing for so long or a group in a city that has had so many lousy owners in Dean Spanos. And then of course, you know, with the, the Los Angeles Clippers at the time when they were the San Diego Clippers, Sterling. I mean, you couldn't ask for two worse owners than those two 
for San Diego, and you finally got a good one in Peter Seidler. And he built this thing up, and he put himself in a position where he wasn't only just saying the cliches, but he was acting on them. And he brought a talented roster here by agreeing to spend money. By saying yes to the big checks. The owner that San Diego had deserved for so long and gone too soon. And so by playing Eric Katsenda's speech of somebody who lost a dear friend to him, and by playing Joe Musgrove's speech, and I'm going to get to Manny Machado's here in a second, you talk about how these guys cared for Peter, had more of a relationship with him than just, you know, owner and player, and maybe just more than a business partner. But you could tell that they want to play for him and want to bring something and and see his vision come to life. I could relate to that to a certain extent with my aunt. My mom's sister, Debbie Jumonko, who was my godmother and probably a second mom to me, passed away of cancer when I was in college. She is somebody that I continue to do what I do and what I love because I know she would be proud of me. Because I used to share, you know, sports with her all the time. She used to take me to Padre games. She used to take me to Charger games. She was the big sports talk radio fan in my family. And kind of got me into this. She used to win prizes on all the different shows, on the radio shows, you know, throughout the years in her time. And her dream was to retire and live in a log cabin in Lake Arrowhead, a place where she bought a property. She worked hard. She didn't have any kids herself. Treated me, my brother, and my sister as her own kids. And when she passed away, she left us that lot in Lake Arrowhead in which I want to make sure there is one day a cabin that sits there to live out her legacy and her dream of what she wanted to accomplish that she was unable to accomplish before she passed away. Now, that being said, it's obviously very difficult uh, for me, a 29-year-old, my sister, a 26-year-old, my brother now are going to be a 23-year-old at our ages to, you know, especially in California, to find the money and invest and all that stuff to try to build a property or build a place in Lake Arrowhead for her. But that is our dream. That's why we won't sell the property and we want to live out the legacy. These guys have that same sentiment where they want to live out Peter Seidler's legacy. They want to live out Peter Seidler's vision and his dream that he was building the blocks of to accomplish in San Diego, and that is winning a championship. So as much as my aunt started to build the blocks and get her finances set up and try to prepare for retirement by buying the lot and everything that goes with that, it has to be us, my, me, my brother, my sister, and I to carry that torch on to try to get that house built one day in Lake Arrowhead. It's the same thing with the San Diego Padres. Peter Seidler built that foundation. He spent the money on getting some of the talented players. He brought in the infrastructure to put these players together to win that championship because Peter Seidler's vision that he had and that goal of his that he had at the end of whenever this was going to end Instead of a log cabin in Lake Arrowhead, it's the parade in San Diego that has been eluding San Diegans for so long to bring a championship here to San Diego. And I believe Joe Musgrove when he says he's going to do everything in his power to try to make that happen and not just saying the cliches. And I say the same thing about Eric Katsenda. And we're going to talk a lot, a little bit more with what Manny Machado had to say. And really, the first big piece as part of this puzzle and a guy that had a really good relationship with Peter Seidler. Here's what Manny Machado had to say yesterday at the Peter Seidler Celebration of Life at Petco Park. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's an honor, Peter. 
one of the great, greatest humans that I've had the privilege of knowing. Peter left a huge mark, not just in the world of baseball, but in our community. His legacy will live through the countless lives he's touched and the impact he made in everyone in this building. The first time I met Peter was uh, back in 2019 when the news, the day after, the news broke that I signed with the San Diego Padres. We had a long luncheon with ownership, front office executives, and all I remember was Peter in the corner tossing a baseball up and down, rubbing it like he was rubbing dirt on it. That was Peter. It was then that I learned Peter's passion, respect, and love that he had for this game. He was a mentor and a friend, and he changed baseball in the city of San Diego forever. Shio, I'm lucky to have witnessed the love Peter had for you and how proud he was of you and your family. He was an inspiration to me. And I thank you for letting me be a part of that. Lady, Shanti, Harry, you guys will always have a brother in me. Whatever you need, I'm just a phone call away. We love you. Peter, I miss you every day. I will always remember all our conversations, a long night talks, having a drink, beyond the lines. It was more than just baseball for Peter. That's what Manny Machado had to say. Obviously, his full one, not necessarily online. I'm sure you can find it on social media. But that was an interesting piece too i mean you heartfelt for manny machado we talk about it all the time i mean manny manny gets a bad rap in major league baseball because of what happened when he was 18 years old in baltimore and being super young in the baltimore orioles organization and the way that he you know operated you know not only as an oriole but as a hired gun for the dodgers and he gets a lot of flack for that you know some immaturity early in his career but as I tell people all the time, Manny Machado has really matured as the San Diego Padre. He's a different player as a Padre than he was as an Oriole or as a Los Angeles Dodger. And you saw that on full display right here. I mean, it's one thing when you have these ownership deaths and you have these celebrations of life and the players come in and talk a lot of them always sound like they're very cliche, but Manny Machado and Joe Musgrove, it wasn't. It was very much heartfelt. You could feel the passion in both of their speeches and what Peter Seidler meant to both them and their families as being members of the Padres organization, you know, more so than just the paycheck. Obviously, there was a relationship there between Manny and Peter Seidler and his family. And there was one for Joe Musgrove. And obviously, with Eric Katsenda being the right-hand man of Peter Seidler for so long. These are players and a partner. We didn't get to get to everybody's speech. where I know we're going to play some during the week. That will do anything that it takes to live on Peter Seidler's legacy. And that is checking their egos at the door. And that's why they're saying a lot of the right things. Not only embarrassed from last year and how they participated in 2022, but now that chip on their shoulder to go play for Peter Seidler. I'm looking forward to seeing what this team can achieve and what this team could be a part of and what they can do despite maybe not having the roster that they had a year ago. Some great speeches yesterday at Peter Seidler's memorial. Peter Seidler, gone too soon. City of San Diego had to pay the respects yesterday and a nice celebration of life yesterday for all of those that were able to attend. I'm Braden Suprenant. When we come back, we'll talk about the Padres' first couple of games in Korea, and then we'll talk about San Diego State's chances to try to get back to the Sweet 16. I'll come up next in the final two segments. 
the Brayden Supranet Show on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
Got the sun popping out here on a Sunday. Braden's Apprentice Show, live and local each and every weekend. So you can follow me on social media at B underscore S-U-R-P. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on TikTok. Follow me on Instagram. You can also follow my YouTube page at B underscore S-U-R-P as well for more content. We are broadcasting live on that YouTube page as well as the fans' YouTube page, Twitch, Twitter, Instagram, and on 97.3 The Fans' Facebook. Talking about Peter Seidler and his legacy and the celebration of life yesterday. Let's talk about his San Diego Padres ball club. Padres last week split with the Los Angeles Dodgers in Korea which I thought was probably what was going to happen. And I thought the Padres did a pretty good job overall. I mean, obviously, the first game got away with the, got away from them, but they had a lead early. Things kind of unraveled there late in the eighth inning. And then it was a shootout in the second game, and the Padres were able to outslug the Dodgers for a game two win. And splitting in Korea was the, I think, the most common place when it comes to expectations of the Padres season. They will now get ready to take on the San Francisco Giants for opening day on Thursday. They got two exhibition games marched, uh, mixed in before that. Coming up tomorrow night at 640, which will be on 97 through the fan, and Tuesday afternoon against the Mariners, which will also be on 97 through the fan. My overall takeaways from the series in Korea, I don't think there's too much you could really look into some of these games just because even though they counted, they still seemed like they were exhibition games. There was high energy, obviously, with the Korean fans. But overall, I mean, it was still it's still early on in the year where you're playing games earlier than you usually do on March 20th and March 21st. So the pitching's not really up to par yet. I thought you Darvish looked pretty good in his debut starting in game one. I thought the bullpen for the most part wasn't that bad. And then when it came to the second game, the pitchers that had to play pitch in back-to-back games kind of struggled with Matsui and Cosgrove, even though Matsui didn't give up any runs, but you could tell he was a little tired. You know, Kolek is a Rule 5 draft pick. I wouldn't weigh too much into what he did in his 13 pitches. He ended up giving up two earned runs on in two-thirds of an inning. Robert Suarez got a four-out save. I thought that was pretty big news. You know, Michael King got hit around a little bit, but that was some good relief for Michael King to get three and a third innings in. And Joe Musgrove, obviously, coming off of an injury, you know, had a high ERA, after that first game, but I'm not overly worried about it. In terms of the offense, it was great to see the top half of the order knock together nine hits in game two. Bogart's in the leadoff spot, two for five with three runs. The Tees was two for four. Jake Cronenworth, a perfect four for four, and two runs scored, and four RBIs. And Manny Machado contributing one for four, two runs, and those three RBIs on that big home run. Late in the game, it was the deciding factor in that game. So a lot of pl- pros to get out of that. There were some cons. I'm not really worried into it. I think it's it's more of an overreaction time. You know, Luis Camposano was three for six in that last game. Tyler Wade had done well. He's hit 600 over there. But, you know, I'm not willing to say Tyler Wade's an everyday Major League Baseball player just as much as I'm not willing to say that Michael King's going to struggle because he had a stat sheet not go his way. So, not too much to break down. The one thing that I will say, you know, and I know Cronworth had a great day on Thursday, game game two of the series. I, I'm not really convinced this is going to be the, this is the number one batting order you could put together. And it never is. I mean, opening day, when you walk down, the catacombs, if you will, in Petco Park. In the cellars and on your way to the clubhouse. And they have every single opening day lineup of the San Diego Padres since 1969 when they started. You look at some of those lineups, you'd be like, well, man, he started opening day for that team? 
It's usually drastic. I don't mind Xander in the leadoff spot per se, but I am curious about, you know, Cronenworth being in the three. And again, I think he did a pretty good job in the second game. Didn't do that well in game one. But I don't know why you would have Jake Cronenworth bat third. And I know they laid out, and AJ Castle did a good job laying out all the pros and reasons why and all that yada yada. Protect him with Tatis and Machado around him and all that other fun stuff. I just don't think he is a three hitter on a playoff team, which is what you want the Padres to be. I mean, to me, that's either Bogarts or Machado. You know, you could have Fernando bat lead off and then go go Kim, Bogarts, Machado. You could have Kim bat lead off, then go Fernando, Machado, Bogarts. I mean, I, I think those four probably need to be in the top four spots. I think on most playoff level teams, Jake Cronenworth is a five or a six hitter anyway. Now, if you start looking at some of these playoff teams, is Jake Cronenworth bat third on their team? I'll throw the Dodgers out because the Dodgers obviously have a loaded lineup. But, you know, is Jake Cronenworth bat third on the Diamondbacks? Jake Cronenworth bat third on the Phillies? He's definitely not batting third on the Braves. If you start comparing all the teams that are expected to make the playoffs, including teams like maybe the Cardinals or the Cubs, Jake Cronenworth might be the worst three-hitter out of the bunch. Which tells me he's not really a three-hitter. So I'm really curious to see what the lineup looks like on opening day. I'm sure they're going to stick with this for a long, for a longer period of time. And we saw Xander get a lot of leadoff at-bats in spring training. But as of right now, you know, I like Fernando in the leadoff spot just because you don't know what he's going to do on the base pass, and I think he scares people. But I wouldn't mind having Kim Bent lean off, followed by Fernando. Go Xander three, Machado four. I think he could flip-flop those. Although we saw with Xander in the four hole, it wasn't that great of a spot for him. And then I think he'd go Camposano five with his pop, and then I think he'd go Cronenworth six. And then you go Profar seven. And then probably Wade eight if he's your third baseman right now. And then I love I love Merrill in the nine hole. I think that does a lot of different things for you. And I again I'm not a big believer in Merrill should have been up because of the situation. But Merrill in the nine spot, I think is great. Because of his speed, contact hitter, second leadoff guy. And then potentially if you go 9-1-2, it's Merrill, Kim, and Tatis at back to the top of the order. And Merrill getting on base for some of the heavy hitters, I think it would be great. Plus, I think it puts less pressure on him to have to go out there and feel like he has to be the guy regardless if he is or not. So we'll see what the Padres decide to do with their lineup. That's how I would do it. I don't really like Xander in the four spot. I think he's kind of cool in the leadoff spot, but... I don't like his speed. So I would go either Tatis or Kim in the leadoff spot. We'll go with Kim right now. Kim, Tatis. I don't mind Xander in the three. I know he hits ground balls. Guys hit ground balls. I mean, Manny hits ground balls too. Kim, Tatis, Bogarts, Machado, Camposano, Cronenworth, Profar, Wade, Merrill. That's how it would go. I think Merrill's the perfect nine hitter. I think even if Merrill hits 450 this year, you leave him at number nine for the first year of the season. He's so valuable there. He's so val- valuable there. And I think if you move him out of the nine spot, it kind of takes some of the value away from him. Even if he does end up hitting better, you don't know necessarily if that's going to translate to higher up in the order. But having him down there in the nine spot, I think is a great spot. I think that's a great spot for Jackson Merrill. Padres got the Giants coming up on Thursday. Opening day, 1 o'clock, Petco Park, home opener. We'll be down at Baja Ricks, the morning show, into the after, the midday show, afternoon show. We'll not be there, obviously, with the game starting at 1. Should be a fun time down in the gas lamp. Get you ready for first pitch. With the pregame show with Sammy Levitt on Thursday. Looking forward to opening day. Looking forward to... Tonight, San Diego State basketball taking on the Yale Bulldogs. 
Winner goes to the Sweet 16. We'll talk more about that when we come back. Braden's Apprentice Show, live and local each and every Sunday. San Diego's number one sports station, 97 through the fan.
Welcome back to the Brayton Supreme Show, live and local each and every Sunday from 8 to 10. Talk some Padres baseball this hour. Talked a lot about Shohei Otani in the first hour. If you missed any of it, all of our shows are archived on line. You can check it out on the Odyssey app on demand features. Rewind today's show. You can also see it on demand and wherever you get your podcast. Plus, our shows are live on YouTube and on social media. You can see all those videos up on those sites as well. Follow me on social media, B underscore S-U-R-P on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, and on YouTube. As for the fan, 97 through the fan SD on Twitter, 97 through the fan on YouTube, Facebook, and everything else. 97 through the fan SD.com where you can see a lot of our articles and different shows posted and whatnot. I did see, I've been seeing some great comments in the chat. There seems to be this kind of play for the Padres trying to get, for Padres fans to want the Padres to get Pete Alonzo. And one guy had a great comment, Junior. We have too many infielders and Pete Alonzo looks like Ralph Wiggum (laughs) from the Simpsons. It's pretty funny. I got a chuckle out of that. Aztecs play today at 6.40 p.m. Pacific time with a trip to the Sweet 16 on the line. Taking a look at the bracket, San Diego State as the five seed, taking on a 13 seed in Yale who upset Auburn last round. I know a lot of people thought Auburn was going to give San Diego State way too much trouble. Instead, they will take on Yale. From the perspective of seeding, obviously a lot better of a draw if you're San Diego State, but you can't overlook Yale. Can't overlook anybody in the NCAA tournament. Aztecs favored by five and a half over Yale tonight at 640 on TBS. Don't want to get into a situation like San Diego State was in a couple of years ago when they beat Oklahoma in the 7-10 matchup and then got slated to play the 15 seed Florida Gulf Coast because they knocked off Georgetown, and then all of a sudden Florida Gulf Coast was going to the Sweet 16 because they buried the Aztecs. Yale's a good basketball team. Now, whether or not Yale used all their resources to knock down Auburn will remain to be seen. A lot of the times, those schools, it's tough for them to make it through the next round, and if they do, they ended up getting crushed in the Sweet 16 because of the disparities and not being able to make a run in those games. So I think from the standpoint of it being a little bit more of a trap and whether or not San Diego State will coast or feel more comfortable against Yale, I think is a problem. But aside from that, I don't really think that game will be too much of a problem for San Diego State. I'm sure it'll be close. Most NCAA tournament games are close. If San Diego State blows out Yale, I think I'd be a little bit surprised in that sense. And they have an opportunity... Don't look too far down the road. I I can. I'm a radio guy. I'm not. I'm not in the locker room. I'm not. I'm not playing in this game. But it potentially matches up with UConn in the Sweet 16. Now they'd have to go to Boston, which sucks. And I talked about that when the seedings came out. It would have been better if they were a six seed in the West and going to LA instead of being a five seed in the East. Where if they make it to the Sweet 16, they got to go to Boston. But it'll be interesting to see. The other two teams in this Sweet 16 on that side have already punched their ticket. Illinois hammered Duquesne 89-63. And Iowa State outlasted Washington State 67-56. It would be the number one seed, the number two seed, the number three seed. And then depending on what San Diego State can do. I'm assuming Northwestern is an upset UConn. Let's talk about Yale for a second. For the second straight year, the Ivy League champions took down a Power 5 champion in the round of 64. Princeton, as a 15 seed, beat Arizona last year and actually made it to the Sweet 16. They were led by Ryan Landboard from La Jolla Country Day, who is now on Northwestern's team. That'll be something to watch for. La Jolla Country Day product Ryan Landboard going against the number one seed in the tournament in the UConn Huskies. He had a big game for Northwestern in their victory in the first round against Florida Atlantic. 
who, by the way, are now looking for a new coach because Florida Atlantic's coach Dustin May is now the new head coach reportedly at Michigan. So now Yale's takedown of Auburn. Is it worth considering the possibility that the Ivy League doesn't have to be a one-bid league? Eh, I don't really necessarily agree with that. They're still one-bid league. They've done really well in the NCAA tournament over the years. I mean, Yale, a handful of years ago, knocked off Baylor, and you had the infamous post-game press conference. If I can find it for you, I'll play it for you. But essentially... What happened was, here I found it. Here's a post-game press conference from Tareen Prince as he was described how Yale was able to out-rebound Baylor in this game a couple of years ago. It's so iconic, I have to play it. So this is from... This is eight years ago now when Yale knocked off Baylor. Here's the post-game press conference. How does Baylor get out-rebounded out by Yale? Yale. Hmm. How's, How's that, that happen? Are you, Are you directing, directing that towards anyone? anyone? Gentleman, Gentleman who just talked about getting out-rebounded. He, he, he has the stat it. sheet. Tari? Tari, Tari you said how do they yeah, have, they they have get, you, you said he got out-rebounded. I was surprised. Right. You did. 36-32. How does Yale out-rebound Baylor? Um, you go up and grab the ball off the rim when it comes off, and then you grab it with two hands, and you come down with it, and that's considered a rebound. So they got more of those than we did. Iconic. Just iconic post-game press conference. I could come up with a list, and I could I could literally put together a sheet of dumb questions asked by media members. And I'm not afraid to say it. I just We got to be better as media members. That was like earlier in the week. We're playing the the post game press conference of Xander Bogarts and Jake Cronenworth. As the Padres just tagged newly acquired Yamamoto, who's going to be on their division rival for a long period of time. A high paid starting pitcher, expected to be their ace. Padres tagged him for five runs. And the first question I asked him was like, How are you able to do that? What did you see out of him? Basically, what were your secrets into destroying Yamamoto in the first inning? Xander Bogarts just responded with no, which is great. 100%. What do you think he's going to say? If they found something that got him an advantage against Yamamoto, why in the world would he say what that advantage was about the pitcher they're going to face probably a thousand more times in his career? Dumb. How does Baylor get out rebounded by Yale? Perfect answer. Absolutely perfect answer. Well, you know, when the ball goes off the rim and you catch it off the rim, it's called a rebound, and they had more of those than we did. That was the last time Yale knocked off a big opponent in the NCAA tournament. What it means for Yale after they were able to beat Auburn. 128 years of ba- 28 years of basketball. This might be the school's most iconic win, dating back to 2016, where they beat Baylor, where the Bulldogs advanced as a number two uh, as a number 12 seed. Friday Stunner in Spokane, product of a career night from junior guard John Pol- uh, Polaticus, who scored 28 points, 10 for 15 shooting, six for uh, for nine from deep. There's a goal and athleticism that Yale had to overcome, but its guards, Bez Men, um, Mebeng, August Mahoney, and Polakidis, Polakidis, all matched up well as and seven foot sophomore Danny Wolf size and mobility was key. I will say with Yale's basketball program and what they stack up with, obviously an intelligent group. They do play at Yale, but. They're going to make the most out of Aztec mistakes where you have to limit mistakes. Whether or not Palaticus can answer what he did against Auburn in the next game, going six for nine from deep, I think that's a major play in this game. And those are things that work when you upset a team in the first round, but those are not consistent entities. 
you can't rely on just guys having big nights in order to win in the NCAA tournament. So I think that is a favor for San Diego State. Now, as for the Aztecs, great performance out of Jaden Ledee on Friday. I mean, he really took over in that game against UAB. When the Aztecs were down late in that game and all of a sudden lost their lead, Jaden Ledee took over in the paint. Jaden Ledee took over with the scoring. Jaden Ledee scored 32 points a new career high for an Aztec basketball player in the NCAA tournament, and they go on to win 69-65. Got better production out of Lamont Butler. You're going to need more of that in this tournament. That comes with guard play. Guard play wins in the NCAA tournament. That's why San Diego State had a good run last year. They had good guard play out of Lamont, out of Darian Trammell, out of Micah Parrish. Those are players that need to have a good game against Yale. Those are guys that need to have good games against UConn potentially in the future. As long as they're playing good basketball, they will be advancing in the NCAA tournament. It's not going to come down to just Ladee. Everybody knows about Jaden Ladee now. He's no longer a secret in college basketball. He got double teamed a lot by UAB. He's been double teamed a lot by the Mountain West Conference. They need the supporting cast to start taking over and contributing. And everybody that played for the Aztecs on Friday scored, with the exception of one, but he only played a couple of minutes. That's the type of contribution you're going to need. All hands on deck in all of these games. And if San Diego State can hopefully prevent Yale from going on a run from beyond the arc, they'll be in a good spot, but they got to be able to take care of business against this Yale team. And don't look down the road to a potential rematch against UConn quite yet. And UConn will play before the Aztecs tip off. And that will be all said and done. So you'll you'll know who your opponent is after you win because the Aztecs are the final game of the night. They play at 6.40 tonight. There's already a game in action. It's Marquette in Colorado. Marquette leads Colorado 39-34, 2.54 to go before halftime. Winner of that game will play NC State in the South region. NC State has already punched their ticket to the Sweet 16. Houston and Texas A&M will play at 540. James Madison and Duke will play at 215 to complete the South region. In the West region, North Carolina punched their ticket yesterday, beating Michigan State 85-69. Arizona beat Dayton. They were the first game of the day yesterday. They won by 10. They will be in Los Angeles. They're awaiting the winners of Clemson and Baylor, who will start at 310 p.m. Pacific time in Grand Canyon and Alabama who will play at 4.10 p.m. Pacific time today. As for the East region where San Diego State is at, UConn and Northwestern will tip off at 4.45. Aztecs and Yale at 6.40 to punch the final two tickets in that Sweet 16. And then finally, only one game left, which is coming up in about an hour and 40 minutes in the East region or the Midwest region, Purdue and Utah State. Winner will play Gonzaga. On the other side, Creighton and Tennessee both won yesterday to complete the Sweet 16. And we'll be talking about Sweet 16 Elite Eight basketball next week. Hopefully the Aztecs are a part of that. Thanks for making my day a part of yours. Greatly appreciate it on a Sunday morning. We'll be back next, actually off next Sunday for Easter. Back the following Sunday on the Brayton Soprenit Show. Be sure to follow me on social media, B underscore S-U-R-P. And we'll talk to you guys this week on Andy and Elston on 97.3 The Fan.